Yes, uh, then welcome to the Science Library here at the University of Oslo for this today's uh, Geo Unstag or Geo Wednesday. Today I have the utmost pleasure to introduce you to Karen Mayer, like here, uh, <laughs> which I just learned. Karen is Scottish and born in Aberdeen in Scotland. And she is a geophysicist, geophysicist from the University of Edinburgh with a PhD in experimental rock mechanics uh, from this same university. And uh, she had uh, until uh, in 1997 to 2000 a postdoc at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, working on friction and earthquake physics. And had a postdoc later on at the University of Liverpool and visiting Toronto and Queensland. And in 2005, she came to the University of Oslo as senior researcher and group leader at the, the Center of Excellence, Center of Physics and Geological Processes, and became full professor in 2018. And during this time, also, she started collaboration with composer Natasha Barrett. Uh, and this culminated in interactive sound installations displayed at Norsk Technisk Museum. Uh, from 2019 to 2021, she took two years leave from, of absence from her academic position here in Oslo and studied design at Edinburgh College of Arts at the University of Edinburgh. And her goal was to explore new ways of communicating sciences. And in 2020, she attained a Master of Arts in Design Informatics in his dissertation about sounding out the environment and in 2021, the Master of Science of Research in Sound Design. So, and work from this thesis she will present now today, and this is a really interesting topic and I'm very anxious to, not anxious, I'm really, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not anxious. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can be anxious. Interested to hear of that. <laughs> My English sucks, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Bernd. Um, thanks for the, the nice introduction. And um, thanks a lot for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm a huge fan of this uh, initiative, so um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be part of it um, in, in, in the other side of the... the, the um, not in the audience, for once. Um, thanks to the library people, before I forget, the tech people and, and all the library people who've helped put this together and who've helped me try to get the sound working. Um, for hi to everyone at home. Um, if you have headphones, wear them, because it will be better um, with the sound files. If for some reason the sounds don't translate very well at home, um, jump on my SoundCloud um, page, Karen Mayer Sound, and you can download the, the main sonifications that I'll, I'll, I'll play today. Also today, I'll, um, I'll, I'll kind of take short snippets of these sonifications. I don't have time to go listen to the whole um, thing. Um, so the full versions are on, on, on the SoundCloud as well. So as Bern said, what I'd like to do today is I'll, I'll, um, I want to share my, really my journey, my adventure over the last uh, couple of years in, um, in sonification for geoscience. So I'll share some of the work from my dissertation that was carried out at the Reed School of Music um, in the University of Edinburgh. Um, that I got um, uh, last, last year, basically I did last year. Um, so, uh, data display um, is dominated by visuals, right? So, um, almost everything we, how we, we, we receive data, how we share data, is heavily still dominated by, by, by visual plots and graphs. And these are a few of the first um, graphs um, and, and a bar, bar chart um, that were um, created by William Playfair, actually in Edinburgh, so there's a nice little link there. And it's about the balance of trade between um, Denmark and Norway and England, which is, again, another <laughs> interesting thing. Anyhow, this is still how we, we share and, um, and, and present a lot of our data, and it's usually how, as scientists, we look at our data to start with. Um, sonification is literally turning data into sound. And it's an innovative um, tool for exploring and also presenting data. It's an alternative 
Um, or it can be an, en an enhancement to a visual display. It doesn't need to be either or. It can be an enhancement to a visual display. display. And it's growing acceptance as a legitimate tool for, for data science and, and data journalism. Um, we presented some work on uh, sonification in, in the EGU conference a few years ago. Um, that was well received and there's growing activity in, in sonification in geoscience um, um, these days. Um, a good question of why use sound, right? Um, some of the reasons are here. Sound is immersive. It can take you to a place. Um, it can transport you, and it can it can give you this. Uh, it can give you a feeling. It can Im immerse you in a in, in a mood or in a location or, or, or things like that. Um, it's also immediately accessible. Um, we process sound very very fast, um, and we don't need to be told how things sound, really. We, we've got a huge bank of memories of sound that we can kind of tap into. Um, because of these sorts of things, it's also accessible, obviously, for people who have visual impairment. So it broadens um, accessibility. Um, but because of these things, it's, it, it's, it's, it's able to engage a wide audience, people who don't like graphs and plots, who don't like log log this and whatever, some simulation of that. Um, so if I just, I just have some, a uh, couple of examples, and now we'll see if the sound works. <laughs> um, so this, um, I'll, I'll just try to take you to this. This is the borders of Scotland. You can see Edinburgh is just in the background. And um, what, I'd, what I'm going to try to do <laughs> is, is, is take you there with sound. Um, and I'm going to do this by plotting here. You can, you can close your eyes if it helps. Okay. Um. Hopefully, you were taken to some sort of rural place with some animals, and then a car came past, right? So it wasn't totally rural, um, but hopefully you got, you got taken to this place, right? I didn't need to tell you. I, I gave you a picture to help you. To, it's, a, it's, it's like the warm-up. It's the warm-up act. <laughs> um, but um, that's, sound can take you there. It can immerse you, and it can, it can maintain your, your attention there. Um, as I said, signs are also memorable. Um, do we recognize that? Oh, I'll even, I'll even put the sound up. Right? Any guesses? Oh, almost, almost. Champagne, actually, <laughs> champagne. But good, good guess. Good, good. You're learning. <laughs> um, what that what that invokes for me is a uh, is um, a party or a celebration. It f kind of makes me joyful, thinking that there's maybe some uh, some some champagne I like, and also celebrating I like. So those are two two things. Okay, so those are things things about sound that's very uh, clear. Why might we use sound for exploring science? Um, now, there's various um, additional reasons that, that sound might be useful for exploring um, science. We perceive patterns really differently with our auditory system than we do with our, with our eyes. Um, so we capture, we capture different aspects. We, there's, some, there's some patterns that we, we, we can, we, we can um, perceive faster, um, and there's some that we wouldn't notice at all with our, with our eyes. So, so there's, there's certain things that, that, that our ears are really well tuned to. Spatial um, sound, we're, we're very attuned to. Um, and this is our survival instinct. We need to know if there's a predator behind us. Um, we've got few preconceived notions about, about sound. How should, how should data sound? 
We don't know, right? We don't have this idea that there's, there's something that should go like that or something that should have this slope, right? Um, so um, it's a bit freer um, and can give us fresh perspectives on our data. The other thing is that we listen through time. You, you have to sit here and listen to my talk to figure out what I'm going to say. You can't just look at it on a, on a page and skim through it. You have, to, you have to be here for the entirety. And this idea of listening through a, a data, a piece of data or a, a physical process or something like this, gives us, again, it, gives us, it makes us stop and think about it. It makes us like, go on a, a small journey. So these are ways that um, sound is quite, is, is, is quite a cool way to, to, to sort of visualize data. Um, now, when we're turning data into sound, I, I'll, I'll go past this very quickly, but there are, I've, I've kind of sorted into three main um, areas of sonification that people use. Um, if you want to know more, check out the sonification handbook because it's got all of the details, really all of them. <laughs> Um, but briefly, audification, this is something that some seismologists might have come across. Um, and this is um, literally, the, the, it's used for the, the speeding up or slowing down of, of waveform data. So if you have data that's a, that's a waveform to start with, um, but is recorded out with the audible range, so too low or too high frequencies, you can pitch it up, you can shift the pitch a bit, and then we can listen to it. And Hugo Benioff, the guy who invented the seismograph, did this in 1953, and he actually released a, an album of earthquake sounds, which is kind of nuts. So Google it, it's really cool. Um, OK, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, ear cons, or auditory icons, are another, another thing. Um, now, and a good example of this is this is like associating an action with a, with a sound. And a good example of this is when you empty your trash on an Apple computer, you get this crumpling paper. And that's something you, oh, I've emptied the trash. Oops. Um, so so you, you have this association that's really good or easy. Um, parameter mapping, this is what I'm going to, to, to talk about basically for the rest of the talk. Um, and this is how you map particular bits of data um, to sound, right? Um, and this is, a, this is a, just a nice figure from uh, Eli Stein's PhD thesis from a couple of years ago. And on the left, you can see some meteorological um, model. He calls them handles. So they're parameters from a, a, a meteorological model that he wants to sonify. And he's got temperature, air pressure, um, water vapor, and they all map to different things in sound. Okay? Now, a very easy way to map is to, often people map data to pitch. So if the, if the graph goes up, you go whoop. If the graph goes down, you know. Sorry, that's as much singing as I'm going to do today. <laughs> it's a shame of a, a stage, actually. It's a bit of a waste of a stage. But, um, but anyway, how, how you, can, you, can, um, you, you, can, you can also map data to the shape the sound, right? So you, you, can, you can do this in a, a, a bit of a more elegant way. So here he suggested to, to map um, data, um, changes in data to filter parameters. This is how you, you shape and, and mold, mold sound. Anybody who's worked with synthesizers will know, will know what cutoff frequency is. This totally changes the sound resonance. So you tap into these, th these things. And this is basic sound design. And so this is the sort of uh, mapping that I've done, and I'll... I'll um, let you listen to today. Um, that was simple mapping. This is complicated mapping. There's many, many possibilities that can be somewhat overwhelming. Um, so we're going to stick to this one <laughs> today. Just this, just this direct one-to-one -one mapping. Um, it has a sea of opportunities. Um, so we need a clear strategy when we're doing this mapping. Um, we can do it in a way that optimizes the clarity of data, data transparency. Um, one of the, the, or we can do it in a way that doesn't. We, we, we need to choose the path we're, we're, we're going to take on, on, on um, um, parameter mapping. Um, we need to translate the, the message efficiently and effectively. And we also need to be able to explain the mapping procedure to listeners. So if we want them to actually figure out what's going on, we need to be able to say, OK, this is how the sound is going to change. And sometimes that can be quite that can be quite a tricky, tricky part. We're going to find out later if I'm able to do that. Um, 
The other thing I want to mention is indexality and intentionality. So this is, I, I like to call them the truth ratio um, and our bias parameter. Um, so indexality is how closely this mapping connects data with sound, right? Is, is, the, is the sound completely, can, can, you, can, you, can you extract back exactly the data that you, um, um, you, you used, you mapped to start with, or is that a bit vague? Um, indexality for, for scientific sonifications will be, will be very high. Um, for artistic sonifications, it, it could be low. You could, you could curate parts of the data set, pull them around, stretch the timescales and, and things like that. Um, so, so, so that is a kind of measure of how direct this mapping is. Um, and intentionality is kind of our bias. Um, I said that, that sounds are, have, have memories attached to them, sounds are coded, and, and um, they, 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 they raise emotion in us. And, and how we choose to use that is quite important, and that's kind of intentionality. So we can either switch on this emotion, we can, we can make the graph sound sad, or we can make it sound happy, or we can, we can play with that. And either, either we have neutral intentionality, we don't do that, or we do. So that, 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 that's a choice, again, a choice we make. Um, sonification for geoscience. Um, I, I divide this for myself into three sorts of um, categories, if you like. Uh, the first is auditory display. So this is just where we, where we are listening and sharing data sets. Um, for this, we'd have a high index. We'd, we're directly mapping things back to the, to, to the data. Um, but we might have variable intentionality. Um, for sonic exploration, if we're, we're digging into our data and trying to find new patterns through sound, um, we are also going to have a high index. We want to know exactly, that, that sound must be exactly when I expect it to be, and it must relate to everything else exactly. Um, and that we will always have a neutral, well, we don't want emotion. We don't have emotion in science. <laughs> um, or at least we want some control over it. Um, the third type is, is more um, sound art and composition. And this is where a sonification is inspired by science, but we might have a really low indexality. So in the same way as the visual artists, they mess around with scales. Ellen Cowan Mellon has, has these beautiful um, images up in the um, Njord um, Center, but she, and sometimes she messes with scales. She juxtaposes scales that like, freak us out as, as geologists who are obsessed with what scale something is at. Um, but, but we do that in sound as well. So we, uh, we, we mix things up, we create them, we grab a bit, this is a nice thing, I'm going to put that there. That's fine in an artistic, um, in an artistic environment. Um, we also might, might want to ladle on emotion in our sounds. So, I'm going to talk about the first, the uh, sort of auditory display, so as a, um, a communication of, of geoscience data sets, and also a little bit at the end, uh, a composition that I've made that is, is really not um, strictly linked to data. So, um, field trips through sound. I'm going to take you on a, a, a little journey now. Um, we're going to start with the atmosphere. Um, so, this is a sonification that I've done of um, the weather forecast. So, I've used uh, MET.no um, data, the Meteorological Office in, um, in Norway, um, and this is all open source software. And I've... Um, okay, uh, let, let's just talk about that <laughs> um, before I get too distracted. Um, again, if you're at home and you can't hear anything, uh, jump, jump on the SoundCloud and hopefully you'll find it there. Um, now, this weather sonification, um, I was very much inspired by the ER weather app, which I love. It's, it's just this beautiful representation of the weather. Whether the weather's good or bad, it's still a beautiful um, app, I think. <laughs> um, and, and what it gives, as many of you will be familiar with, what it gives is like a, a, a table, graph, and also this beautiful sky animation of, of the weather forecast for the next few days. Um, so what I've done, what I like most about this, 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 um, the weather app is 
um, how the sky animation melts and the, the, the clouds um, fade into each other. Like, it's really smooth um, and it's not boring. It changes enough that you're, you're just, you just drift along with it. So that was really one of the things I wanted to do in my sonification. I wanted to, to meld the sound in this sort of way. Um, so I uh, took the data, so I, I actually just put the app on the side, and I, I went to MET, grabbed data for three days, and I sonified it um, using my Max. This is the front page of my um, Max patch. Anyone who is an audio programmer will be familiar with this. But this allows me to control um, um, the sounds that you're going to hear that are associated with with particular data. And in this, in this patch, um, I can actually drive this in an interactive way, or I can I drive it by, by data. And there's various, um, you don't need to look at all the details of this, but um, I map wind direction to wind panning. I map um, precipitation, the amount of rain, to the amount of rain you're going to hear. Um, and what else? the frequency of the wind changes a bit when the temperature changes. Um, if you want to know the details of this, I will talk at length about that to you, <laughs> at you, <laughs> afterwards. Um, some of my ma mappings are here. But what, what I've, I've tried to make this as easy as possible to listen to, so you shouldn't need instructions. If I've done a job, good job, you should just be immersed in, in what the weather is going to be like. So, let's see if it... Um, this is working here. So it calms down a bit overnight, and you have a little steelier, a little thinner sounding wind. Okay, now it's time to wake up. Sun in Scotland is quite unusual, <laughs> but it doesn't stay for long. <laughs> Okay, and you should hear the breeze coming from that side. Seem to wake up again. Quite a lot of wind now. It's rush hour, so we've got some cars going home. And there's a bit of outdoor music because it's uh, festival time in Edinburgh. So we get this wafting on the wind in, in the end. That's my weather sonification. And I have just, I've, I've just grabbed this, this screenshot of the ER app, um, which I hope is legal, um, to, to display here with the, with the sonification. So thanks to them for making this beautiful app that inspired me. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's move, move on to the surface of the Earth. Um, 
and talk about river uh, dynamics. We've got this, uh, the next sonification is about uh, river dynamics. And this um, work is inspired by the, a project, Sounding Out the River, that's led by Mark Naylor um, at the University of Edinburgh. And this is a project that I got involved with um, uh, when I was uh, across there, I sort of moonlighting while I was uh, doing my, my design degree. Um, but the project is to build a low cost, to build and test a low cost geophysical monitoring um, system. To, to monitor bed load movement along a river. So the idea is like they, they, they've set out a whole bunch of seismometers and uh, river flow monitors and many different types of different monitors from proper geophysical instruments to raspberry shakes. And they've actually devised their own like Arduino, geoduino, geoduinos. They've, which is kind of hard to say, it turns out. <laughs> um, but the idea is to monitor what the river is doing and like, see if we can actually hear when boulders are moving. Um, and the idea is to have this sort of system that can be deployed in um, areas where boulders moving change the path of a river and, and might, might lead to flooding in, 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 uh, in uh, major events. So the idea is that Mark and his collaborators, they work out in Nepal, so that's the, the, the final site that they want to install this system on. Anyhow, um, um, I w was up there when, when they started to do these measurements. We had this, this was the same day actually, the two, the two photographs are on the same day. So we had this beautiful weather and then we had this crazy um, kind of storm that came through. Um, and, and they're monitoring also visually, so they've, they've got a bunch of cameras up there now, so we can re we've really got a nice um, data set of what's happening um, in the river. So I worked with Mark and his um, PhD student, um, Bronwyn Matthews, um, looking for interesting events in this data set that I could sonify. And we picked this amazing event, uh, um, the, 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 this amazing like, cold spell last, last uh, February to March. Halfway through February, there was, there was a very, very cold spell. So the whole of um, Scotland covered in snow. This is very unusual. Um, and then the temperature kicked up. So you see the kick in this, this graph. There's a graph of temperature. We've got February, March, and there's a graph of river height. So unsurprisingly, these two things are, 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 are um, connected, right? So we have this kick in, 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 in temperature. Um, all this snow that's been stuck in the mountains um, um, melts. And we get a big slug of water coming down this, the, the, the river. Um, we get this high flow, and then these, these kind of interesting events. And um, that, that was a, a really nice thing to monitor. Um, so we picked this event, and, um, and then I thought about how I would, I, I would, I would sonify that. Um, and I decided to do that mainly with, natural, uh, with field recordings of the natural system. So I used hydrophones. Um, put, them, put, put actually sensors into the river. I used this audio moth little thing to get ambient sound. I used contact mics. I built this one myself. You can probably tell. <laughs> um, it works though. <laughs> um, and sometimes when I needed um, measurement, I needed I needed the sound of ice clinking together, as this happened in the in the in the um, data set we discovered, and I didn't have access to ice or the river. Um, I did the gin and tonic <laughs> equivalent. So I uh, stuck a hydrophone into ice melting. So I could get these sucks and these um, clinks of, of, of ice. So I could use those sounds as sources for my sonification. OK, so um, yeah. Um, I'll um, oh, I'm just, just going to show this, this data set. This is actually the, the, this, one of the seismographs that we measured. And you can hopefully see, there's a bunch of colors, but you can hopefully two, see two big stripes on there, right? Two vertical stripes. Um, and these were unusual events in the, seis in the seismic um, signals. And I've kind of given the game away already of what these are. But these are actually um, ice floats clinking right next to the, the, the seismometers. And, and so they're, they're, they're clinking, and, and it's heard on all sorts of frequencies. So that's why it's this vertical line. Um, and when we looked back 
um, so we use this to kind of home in on, on, on which, which days things were happening. Um, and then when we looked back, we actually saw these ice patches flowing down the river. Um, so that's, that, that's, that was kind of smoking gun for us. <laughs> um, and then I sonified where we had those events, I triggered my gin and tonic sounds. So this is what you're, you're, you're going to hear. Um, OK, so this, this sonification is quite long, and um, I've still got another one to, to show you. So I'm going to jump around a little bit, um, just give you a taste of this. But please listen yourselves afterwards. It's quite good to get to sleep to, apparently. Somebody, somebody told me. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. but. Uh. <laughs> So you should hear the, the ambience of the area and the river flowing, you know, a bit of bumbling around, maybe sometimes it's moving on the, on the, on the surface. There's a little thing that's like timpani, which are There are also some cold sounds, because this is the cold spell. So you've got some little tinkles that make you think that it's maybe it's cold. Whoop. Sorry, that wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> I'm going to try to get over here. I'm not, I'm not finding the part I wanted to find, but, but, but basically when we go over this kick and we have this river flow, you get, you get stronger signal. So now you're starting to get this, this stronger event. So you hear the ice clinking together here. Okay, I'm going to take you right to the end, because when we go from February to March, we're basically undergoing this change from winter to spring. We've kind of accelerated it up a bit. So if we go into March now, and maybe we get right to the end of this. You still have the river there, but what you can hopefully hear is there's a wider soundscape. You have some birds, and you have some, you have some bees, and these things are all tagged to the temperature data, so I uh, and the date actually, so I have certain birds come in when they get certain certain sorts of dates. Okay, so you can listen to that all, all the way through if you if you want to <laughs> afterwards. Um, so briefly, I will just. Um, we need to go below the Earth right now. Um, so I will um, I'll talk about a, a, a sonification I did um, about, about folds, geological folds. Um, geological folds are like Brunost on a hot day, <laughs> right? Did that, did that get it for, for anybody? <laughs> yes. OK. It's when rocks. Um, rocks at the surface tend to break and snap and slide, and I like that sort of stuff, that's pretty cool. But rocks, when they're at depth or they're warm, they, they, they don't break or snap. They fold and bend and crumple, right? So when, when the, the Earth's stresses act on them. Um, and it is a bit like Brunos, which is a, a Norwegian delicacy. <laughs> um, on a hot day, it <laughs> delicacy. Um, on a hot day, it, 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 it rolls off the end of your, your shiver of uh, bread, right? 
And, and that's kind of a, it's a little bit the same as folds. Anyway, folds in, in geological systems, um, they, they, they kind of approximate, for me, they, they're, they're approximated by sine waves. So when I thought about this fold sonification, um, I thought, how do I, um, how do I kind of mimic these, the, the, these structures? Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was, um, it was inspired by the legendary geologist John Ramsey, who was the, the first one to really identify fold interference patterns. So when you have one episode of folding, and then you have another episode of folding that messes up the first one, and you get this kind of dialogue between them. But then he, because he's a brilliant field geologist, managed to unravel these events. So by very careful field observations, he managed to figure out that there were two things happening, and he managed to separate things out. And he managed to explain that to people, and, and that's, that was a great skill. Um, and so as a kind of tribute to, to, to John for, for um, a celebration of his work, I made this sonification. And the idea is that it mimics um, one set of folds occurring, um, and, and when we have folds, we all have these little folds, like uh, the image here from Rob Butler, um, these little ones on top of superimposed. Um, and then if, we, if they change direction, if the folding episode, if we have a second episode that refolds the first thing, and then you have a glacier comes and swipes off the top part, what you're left with are these amazing patterns on the ground that you can, you can look at. And if you're John Ramsey or like follow his, his uh, methods, you can actually unravel these and figure out what, what happened and how the folds interacted. Um, I, I won't say any more about this, that, just, just that this, is not, um, this is not a direct high index sonification. This is a composition that's inspired by um, this fold interference patterns and um, the idea is to get a sense of this interaction of these things and how it's, but how it's still distinct somehow.
Okay, I think I'll, I'll stop that one there because um, we're getting short of time, but um, please wait. feel free to uh, listen on your own with headphones and close your eyes. Um, so um, that's, that's basically what I had to share with you today. Um, in conclusion, I just want to say that I think sonification is a really valuable tool uh, for communicating geoscience. Um, it's accessible, it's engaging, and it's memorable. Um, but mapping data to sound needs a bit of, it needs a bit of responsibility, right? Um, and needs a bit of clarity about exactly what you're doing. I've tried to explain some of these things, and I, I've taken you on some field trips through my sound um, that you can enjoy later. Um, so thank you for coming, especially the people who came from New Zealand. <laughs> and um, come ask me questions, bother me if you're interested. Um, and I'd just like to thank these people who have all um, helped me, inspired me, or, or encouraged me um, um, in, the, in the last few years in this venture. So thank you very much. Yes, yeah, it was on. Yes, thank you very much, Karen, for this very, very interesting and inspiring, it's what's the right word? Inspiring <laughs> presentation. I take it, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, now it's actually place or time for questions. Somebody want to ask Karen something? Please do so. So has there been some scientific insight through sonification that wasn't available through sort of more traditional visual tools? That's a, yeah, that's a good uh, question, thanks. Um, yes, I, I would say I, I, sonification for like finding new things and in, 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 um, in interrogating data um, is, has been used quite a lot in, in the, uh, the astronomy field, actually. And um, so that's, that's perhaps the field where it's, there's a kind of love affair <laughs> in, the, in the, the, the sonification community. There's kind of a love affair between astronomy and, um, and um, sonification. And I think the thing is, because there's vast data sets and there's really small changes and signals. So with a lot of this, I'm not really familiar with the, 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 the data sets, but there's a lot of really... Um, um, th there's lots of things that you, 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 you can identify with your ears very easily, but they're very hard to have the right scale on your graph or to, to, to do some spectral analysis or something like that. They've been used extensively. So they've been used extensively for in, in the astronomy field. And there's actually one um, um, astrophysicist, uh, Wanda Merced, I think her, her name is, who is actually blind. And she, I mean, the, the sonification was used quite a while ago in, in astronomy, then, then it kind of went out of fashion a bit as, as numerical tools and things developed. Um, but she brought it back because she wanted to be an astronomer and she couldn't see. So she, she, she brought this back and is, is using um, sound. That, that's her main way that she interacts with her data. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Some rather ignorant question. Is there any application for uh, cryptology, like sending a file coded with... Uh, I'm thinking about this movie, I think it was Contacts, uh, where they... <laughs> 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 uh, 
I, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Potentially. Potentially, yeah. That's something I haven't, haven't thought about. It could be really subtle, right? You could just imagine. Yeah. Well, that's something to work on. Thanks, Karen. It was really, uh, really nice. I wonder if, uh, if this kind of technique is used also for teaching for students mm. to try to engage them more in the discipline and if that's something you would like to do as well. Yeah, th that's a really nice... And how uh, to do it then? Well, yeah, <laughs> how to do it is always a, the, <laughs> the question. Um, I think it definitely... It, 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 that, that's, a, that, that's an open playing field. I, I don't think it's been used very widely. And I think, to be honest, anything that um, can engage or encourage um, is a good thing. So let's try it. Um, so I got the small grant from iEarth the center in Bergen um, as to do a prototype study on this. So we're going to take a couple of, or maybe one of my, my lessons in geomechanics, and we're going to try to sonify this. So that's with Matteo de Mertes and also uh, sound designer Elliot Termont in uh, Edinburgh. So it's just this, this small kind of prototype. We'll take one, maybe a set of graphs or some rheology, maybe some, some topic, and um, sonify it, make a soundtrack out of it and see how um, the students react. Um, and th then there's a novelty factor in it. So like initially we're, we're probably going to do really well because it's just different. Um, and whether it's sustainable or what parts of it are sustainable, that's, that's what we need to, I think that's what we need to investigate. So last question here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Karen. I, I think this is potentially such a powerful way to communicate uh, our science, but for most of us, you know, we, are, we don't have your expertise or, or a degree uh, to, to do this. So, uh, but I heard you also say that it takes some investment or responsibility to, to sonify your science. So how, how can this be used uh, by more of us to communicate our science in a more engaging way? Um, I'm not sure the, the answer to that. Um, I I think um, I think to start with how how I would how I would approach it to start with is is to f to find uh, good data stories. I mean, that, and that's what I've done in these sonifications. I've found. Um, I mean that. We, we were monitoring that river all the time, <laughs> and an awful lot of it is really boring because <laughs> nothing much is happening. So to to engage people, you, you need a story, you know, you, and, and you need you need something that's changing. Um, and then um, I, I don't have that bit figured out yet. I'm just trying to get people excited about doing it. So well, you managed. So let's let's yeah. Well, let, 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 let's let's talk about it. And people who have data sets, they want to sonify then let's discuss it and, and, and think if we can come up with some ways. There's lots of young sound designers in Edinburgh, my old, my old buddies, who are looking for jobs. So maybe we can uh, get, get, if you're out there, guys. <laughs> it's a plug for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, last, very last question. What are your plans now? What is your next project? Uh, well, I have, a, I have a cool project, actually, with Ulf Holbrook, who's sitting here. Um, so we're, we're going to work on a sound sculpture. Geomorphology. Geomorphology. I, I knew you'd like that one, Bird. And, and there's going to be an actual, actually physical sculpture, but you're going to plug into different geological layers and listen to the geology underneath. So we have, to, we have to please everyone. We can have the atmosphere, we can have the surface, and we can also have the, the, de the deep geology. So. Um, Bergen Lead Galleria in September, Somewhere? November, um, and then we might drag it back here afterwards and uh, have an event here. Yeah, keep me informed, VF. I do. Uh, <laughs> I do a lot to get this here. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for this presentation once more. Then uh, I guess we'll see again, I think it's the six, around the 16th of May, also 
18th of May, also it's only f a couple of weeks, uh, there will come the last uh, Geo Wednesday for this semester. So until now, goodbye and have a nice <laughs> work day. Thank you.